God is here. God is here. I'm about to ask you to do something a little uncomfortable. I want to have everyone's attention in this room. I want you to look to the person closest to you and ask them, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior right now? I want you to ask them, and if they say, I'm not sure or no, I'm not going to tell you to bring them up here. I want you to pray with them and ask, are they ready? Do they want Jesus to save them? I want you to pray with them. God's going to use you. Do you know Jesus? And if he's not your Lord, do you want to know him right now? If they say yes, I need somebody to start praying with some folks right now. Go ahead and keep playing, Ben. Start praying with somebody. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? And if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, right this instant, if you were to die right now, not sure if you'd go to heaven or hell, would you like to make sure? Let me pray with you. Mm, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Saints of God, let's just pray for just a moment. Oh, God, move now, I pray. Move now, I pray. Holy Spirit of God, you've touched us. You've blessed us. You've ministered to us. While you're moving, Lord, we want to give people opportunity to surrender their lives to you. My Lord, if God moves on you to go across the building right now, you better move. If God's telling you to go to... Go to talk to somebody. You better hurry. I don't care if you're on this stage or if you're in the bathroom or in the nursery. It doesn't matter. If God tells you to go, you better go to somebody right now. Don't get in the flesh, but if God tells you, you obey. My Lord. Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him? Well, I've heard Bible stories. That's not enough. You've got to know him as your personal Savior. Holy, holy, holy are you, God. We are certainly in your house, Lord. God, sometimes it cracks me up a little bit because I remember when this was a, a store. When they built this building, they had no idea you were going to move in. I'm glad you did. I'm glad I've been able to witness firsthand in five years all the souls that have been transformed, saved, delivered, healed, filled with the Holy Ghost. God, I pray you expand our territory. That, Lord, this entire city is going to be blanketed with a move of revival and awakening. That, God, they'll hardly be able to have class in the schools because of a move of the Spirit. Pray the churches will light up like a torch. It does not matter, God, to us what the denominational name is. I pray you light up the Baptist, the Methodist, the Assembly of God, Church of God, any other denomination in this city, independent. My God, let it spread. We love you. We welcome you to move in this place. In Jesus' name, anoint your word today. Amen. Children, you're welcome to go to children's church, toddler age, fruit loops, what we call them. You're welcome to go to your class on the other side through those doors oh I th- thank the Lord for people that are obedient Ben and Deanna appreciate y'all letting the Lord use you today I'm not going to look at my watch don't anybody flash yours at me because I've got to preach a word amen when the leper became a dipper Hey, some high schoolers would about shout on that and thinking I'm condoning dipping tobacco, but praise God, I don't condone that. I'm talking about a different kind of dipping. When the leper became a dipper. How about we stand for the reading of the word and then I'll let you be seated. 2 Kings chapter 5. I want to read verse 1, then you're welcome to have a seat. Now Naaman commander of the army of the king of Syria was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord make sure we know who we're talking about here he said this is a guy that's in Syria not a Jew by him the Lord had given victory to Syria he was also a mighty man of valor but a leper amen you may be seated 
Did you know the Lord will use whoever he wants to use? Isn't that awesome? I got good news for you, Brother Ricky, and everybody else in the building. Regardless of who gets put in the Oval Office January 2017, God's going to use them. They can't even stop him from using them. They may think they're, they might even think they've sold their soul to the devil. And I don't, I wouldn't go that drastic, but I'm just telling you how extreme it could be. And God would still use them. You know how I know that? Because God uses the devil. Uh-oh. Say, what are you talking about, pastor? Everything that's taken place throughout history, God has had reigns on the devil. And he will only allow Satan to do what God wants him to do. Or, or allows, I should say, him to do. And when the devil starts getting out of line, God pulls back on those reins figuratively and stops, halts what the devil is trying to do. You know why you're not dead today? Because God grabbed hold of the reins of Satan and said, you won't kill them. You will not take them out. You won't touch them until I say it's time. So devil, you might as well sit down, read you a good newspaper and drink a cup of coffee because until I take my hand off them, which I never will, you cannot destroy them. You're here today. Because God controls even what the most evil beings in the universe do. In this story, we find out that there was a man by the name of Naaman. He was the commander of the army of Syria, like a type of general, captain uh, position. Very high ranking. And we discover that this man has a major problem. The Bible says that he is a leper. I've described leprosy many times from this pulpit, but to give you a brief summary, the skin and the, uh, mainly the skin, but a lot of parts of the body begin to die, dry up. Sometimes you will lose members of your body uh, due to this horrible disease, and it just continues to get worse until the point where the disease kills you. So Naaman was in trouble. He did not have a good diagnosis. It was not as if he was just going to recover in a few months and everything would be back to normal. He needed a miracle from God. Now, just to clarify who Naaman really is, we have to go to 1 Kings 22, which is past tense from the time that I just described. Before he was in Syria and, and looking for a healing, he was on a battlefield in Israel. And we discover there was a certain man who drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. There is a Jewish commentary called the Midrash, M-I-D-R-A-S-H. Uh, as we have commentaries like Matthew Henry today, the Jews had a commentary on Scripture. And as you read this commentary, you will discover that the man who, uh, the certain man who drew the uh, arrow, the bow, and shot the king of Israel at that time was Naaman. So Naaman gained great acclaim. Uh, he was widely known in his country because he took down the king of Israel. So that was a high honor if you were to go into battle and take down the leader of another army. So there's history between Naaman and Israel, and it's going to be very important because if you've killed somebody's king, years later you don't just come walking in there like your best buddies with everybody. Uh, you're probably going to be receiving many glares and stares and probably death threats. I can imagine some posters being held up in Hebrew. We've got your number. I mean, you can imagine how bad it would have been. But we see here that he is desperate. Verse 2, the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. This is a perfect example of how God is in control. Through a terrible act of kidnapping of a Jewish girl, God was about to awaken an idol-worshiping commander of an army. Through one girl, God was about to bring revival to a man and everyone that he would meet. We go on with verse 3. Then she said to her mistress, now this is the slave girl that's Jewish, speaking to Naaman's wife, <clears throat> If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. There are too many of us who discount the anointed word of young people. Tonight I'm going to share a message that will shake you to your very soul, involving young people all over the world. 
right now, not 50 years ago, but right now, who God is using to shake their nations. So make sure, regardless of your age, please, that you are here tonight. I've got another testimony that's burning in my soul that I just received regarding my daughter, Chloe, who is on a trip to Perry Stone's Warrior Fest and uh, about uh, shook me loose when I was brushing my teeth and <laughs> getting ready for church this morning. Uh, but God is moving on her, and I am expecting her to be back in time tonight to share with you what God is doing. Uh, God is stirring the hearts of the youth. Amen. So the girl speaks up and says, Hey, if we could just get my master in touch with a man that I know, a man by the name of Elisha, a man who is not here but who is in Israel, I know that he would heal him. Then the king of Syria responding to Naaman said in verse 5, Go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. Ironically, the place where that Naaman achieved his, one of his greatest acts of valor in battle was also the only place where he would receive a miracle of healing. It's quite ironic how God moves that way. Naaman came to Israel in the past as a conqueror. This time he would come as a leper. The last time Naaman came to Israel, he was in control. But this time, he was losing control of his own body. Naaman needed something that Syria, Syria's kings, and Syria's gods could not provide. He needed a miracle that only Jehovah Jireh, that only Jehovah Rapha, my healer, could provide. You know, I relate to this, and you probably do too if you're saved, because there was a point in your life where you admitted you could not get anything good from your past to help your present and future. There was nothing that you could grab hold of, no uh, lesson from your childhood, nothing mom or daddy had just said that could actually solve your sin problem. You needed to come in contact with the king. You had a letter called the Holy Word of God, and when you took this letter before the Father, you said, Father, you said, if we confess our sins, read the letter, Father, it says, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness when you approach God with this letter God always responds favorably with your faith and he forgave you of your sins John 10 verse 9 it says I am the door who is speaking here it is Jesus if anyone enters by me he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture there is only one way Revival will not come to the United States of America by us saying we agree with everybody as long as we can get along. Revival will not come to the political leaders and to the educational leaders and uh, military leaders as long as we say, well, let's just not be offensive and let's all tolerate one another's beliefs and we'll be uh, all together in the end. Well, you might be all together, but it probably won't be the place you want to be in the end. The only way you're going to be in heaven and with Jesus is if you serve the only Son of God who is Jesus Christ, if you confess him as Lord and allow him to rule your life every day of your life, that's the only way that we can make it to glory. <clears throat> if Naaman, Naaman knew anything about Jewish law, it was that lepers were considered outcast. Uh, he was not going to go rolling in on a chariot or, or riding a horse and expect everybody to bow down and say, oh, you great commander of the army of Syria. No, they would have shunned him and expected him to yell out, unclean. So what's unusual about this miracle is God expected Naaman to go to a place where that people would reject him the most. Isn't that odd? I say, wait, God, I, I thought when I got my miracle, everybody was going to be excited about it. Not always. Sometimes God puts you right in the middle of a family who uh, it, it's all they can do not to curse God because they're so heathen. They're, it's, sometimes God will put you right in the middle of, of a group <clears throat> and it's hard to keep your mind on Jesus because they're telling dirty jokes or they're saying vulgar things and letting out words they shouldn't. And, and, and faith is the very last thing on their mind. But God says, I'm not going to heal you at the church. I'm going to heal you right in the middle of your pagan family. I'm going to heal you right smack dab in the middle of a hospital that's got a, a, a doctor that just cursed me 30 minutes ago, a nurse who, who is going through a divorce and she's about to give up hope on life. I'm going to heal you right in the middle of everybody who has the least amount of faith possible because in that situation I will receive the most glory 
Now, God heals many people inside the church surrounded by faith. We know that we are to go and, and to call the elders of the church and let them anoint us with oil and pray over us. We know that. <clears throat> but time and time again, God has proven, just like when, oh, I'm going to get off my topic a little bit, but i got to go there. Just like over in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Iran, you are hearing of countless numbers of quote-unquote Muslims who do not know Jesus and do not have a Pentecostal church on the corner where they can go have revival on Sundays. Matter of fact, if, if there was a revival going on, the government would come and kill them. But these Muslims do not have the influence that you have every week. And yet, guess what's happening? In the middle of the Islamists, in the middle of the Muslims, in the middle of the middle of those who don't even believe in God, God is giving dreams. Jesus is stepping foot into the soul of people who are sleeping in bed, snoring, waiting on the alarm clock to go off the next morning. And Jesus shows up and says, I am he. I am Jesus. There is no other way to the Father, not to Allah, but to Jehovah, except through me. You know what's happening over in Afghanistan and Iran and Iraq, Afghanistan? There are Muslims coming to Jesus by the thousands. They wake up they know they've not just had a pizza dream and they go running looking for somebody. Maybe they turn on their television and they find TBN, but they look for somebody who can explain, what have I just dreamed? What does it mean? And Muslims are coming to Jesus by the thousands every year. Why? Because God is stepping in the middle of the most doubt possible and saying, I'll still show myself big and powerful. No matter who believes me, I still am who I am. That's what God will do. So he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. Having killed the former king of Israel, Naaman knew that it would be wise to bring with him a huge amount of payment in the form of treasure and uh, uh, types of different clothing it described. Verse 6, then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised... When this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you, look at your neighbor and say, you, you may heal him of his leprosy. The Jewish girl had been very clear that it was not the king of Israel who would kill, um, kill who would heal Naaman. It would only be Elisha. And yet Naaman is sent to the king of Israel to be healed. Let me explain to you what was happening here. It's called protocol. They're describing reverence in Sunday school this week, next week, maybe some others. And protocol and reverence line up very well together because reverence understands protocol. Protocol is when you know your place and you realize what it's going to take to get from point A to point B without disrespecting somebody in the middle. Naaman understood that if he was going to reach Elisha properly, according to protocol, he knew needed to go through the king. Now this did two things. Number one, it showed honor to the king, but it also gave the king an opportunity to share in the credit if that Naaman were to be healed. Now, the, again, the king did not heal the man, but if the man went through the king to Elisha, the king would receive partial credit. So it worked on all ends. Verse 7, and it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. The king of Israel was misunderstanding. The king of Israel was saying, this king of Syria is trying to pick a fight with me. And if I don't heal Naaman, then he's going to come after me with his army. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he said to the king, saying, he sent to the king, why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know there is a prophet that is in Israel. There is a prophet in Israel. Did you know that God still heals today. Amen. There's still a prophet in America. There's still apostles and teachers and pastors and evangelists, praise God, in America. And God did not uh, take uh, off of his shift and say, hey, I'm going to let an angel take my place for about 30 years and we're just going to let America float by. God is still on the throne and he is still guiding everything that is taking place. That's encouraging to me. I see here, that he said, let this man come to me so he can see there is still a prophet in Israel. I believe with the type of awakening that is happening already in America, and, and just so you'll know, this weekend in California, 
near Azusa Street. Uh, I think it's Los Angeles is, is where it's going to be a huge convention called Azusa Now. And there will be hundred, possibly hundreds of thousands of people coming from all over the world who will be meeting in that area in commemoration of what God did 110 years ago and what God is about to light up and start right now in the world and in the United States of America. I believe that God still desires to shake this nation. I believe just as when Elisha sent to the king and said, hey, let Naaman come to me so he can find out there really is a prophet left in Israel. I believe you're going to hear of some of the same things happening in hospitals where the doctors will do all they can according to their knowledge, and I'm so thankful for them. But there will be many times where, oh, Lord, help me. Mm, Sister Joplin, I feel like I'm going to go somewhere right here. I believe doctors are going to get to a point where they'll say, when I've done all I can do, They'll turn to the family and they'll say, family, you need to go down to such and such church. Now, it could be New Haven or somewhere else. I believe God's going to move through all the churches if they'll let him. But you need to take your family member because I have done everything within the realm of science and medical help that I can do. You need to get them in the wheelchair, take them to the hospital, I mean, take them to the, the church and let those saints pray over them because every time I'm sending folks over there, they're getting out of wheelchairs and they're being healed. Cancer's falling off on the floor. The deaf ears are open. The blind eyes are able to see you need to get them out of this place we've done all we can and get them to the house of the living God so that he can move why because there is still a God in the United States of America and he still heals today let it be said of our church and any other church represented by you here in this room or those listening by internet, let it be known that our church is one of those churches where that people can come and that they can uh, agree as we agree with them and we will see miracles take place. You want to see a church grow, expand, explode, and touch an entire city? You let the gifts of the Spirit become evident in such a way that people can hardly walk in the door without falling down under the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. That they can hardly get into an altar before when we lay hands on them, they instantly are made whole and sickness and disease have to leave. You want to see true revival? You get ready. When God starts moving with those kind of gifts of the Spirit, you'll see revival, honey. But what is it going to take? It will take a people who are not afraid to pray. It will take a people who know that God's not dead. He's still alive. It'll take a people who will stand when nobody else stands. Who'll go to court to fight for their children in public schools when nobody else will stand with them. Who'll stand up against abortion and speak with love to the women who are about to kill their babies. And as they speak about the beauty of life and how that, honey, you wouldn't have that kid if God didn't speak a soul into your womb. Then maybe the mother will turn her heart to God and say, my God, I was about to kill my baby. But Lord Jesus, I am sorry and I'm going to raise this child in the admonition of the Lord and every Sunday will be in church and every Wednesday will be in training hour. Hallelujah. I believe it can happen because the anointing still breaks the yoke. There is still a God in the United States of America and his name is Jehovah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God for his anointing. If we're going to preach about a God who can heal, we better believe that he can do it. If we're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit, we better exhibit the gifts of the Spirit. Many times, reasons you don't hear pastors stand up and talk about tongues and interpretation and gift of healing and gift of faith and gift of wisdom and word of knowledge is because they do not flow in any of them and it's difficult to talk about something if you don't flow in it or nobody in your church does. But I've come to tell you there's a generation about to stand up in faith. There's a bunch of young people in the United States of America who their mama and their daddy never spoke in tongues. Their granddaddy might have never laid hands on nobody and then been healed. They might have never seen a pastor give an interpretation of tongues. But these young people will not be satisfied with complacency or icebergs sitting in the churches. Anybody with me? I feel like I'm by myself. I believe there's a generation that's about to rise up. There are some in your early 20s and you ain't ever seen nothing like this but God's about to get a hold of you with the power of the Holy Ghost and you're going to say let them sit where they are. Let the pastor keep doing what he's doing. I can't do it anymore. I'll go meet in a shed with five people and have a Holy Ghost party if that's what it takes but I've got to have more of him. Mm, if it takes getting out of your nice cathedrals or your huge coliseums where thousands or hundreds come together and everybody's dressed up in a suit and tie, get out of the place if God's not moving. Get out of the place if nobody's getting saved and hit the streets. You'll have more of God at the mall than you'll have at the church if the Holy Ghost didn't welcome. But if the youth of this United States get out of the building and start carrying the gospel to the public schools and to the malls and to Walmart, you will see revival that we have never seen in a six-week revival in any 
church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. This is Jesus speaking to the church. He said, and greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There's not one person in this church that will ever speak in tongues to bring glory to you. There's not one person that will ever lay hands on the sick and say, oh, I hope God heals because people are going to think better of me. If you, if you have that kind of attitude, I'm going to have a meeting with you and let you know it's not about you. You don't jump up and, and start doing your shout and running all over the and, and nobody here does this but I'm saying you're not, you're not going to do that in the flesh saying oh I want people to look at me because I'll have a meeting with you right quick and let you know you will not take glory away from my God ain't nobody going to get the royalty and the glory that belongs only to the king I won't approach you mean I'll come to you in love but I'm here to tell you we're going to have this church to be lined up in order in reverence and holiness and righteousness and we're going to be so pleasing to God that when anything takes place in the spirit you're going to know it's real and God will be in it. Hallelujah. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Did you know that I'm not satisfied with the amount of signs and wonders we're seeing here? I'm not satisfied with the amount of times that people are calling me during the week saying I just led somebody to the Lord. Now it does happen some, but I'm not satisfied with the number of times it is happening. I want to be getting at least 10 phone calls a week. You say, well, it's supposed to happen in the church. No, it's supposed to happen wherever you are because wherever you are is wherever the Holy Ghost is. He dwells in you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Everywhere you go, you're mm, everywhere you go, you're bringing church with you. Can I get an amen? Oh, hallelujah! Wherever you go, you're bringing revival and awakening with you. So I am believing and praying that I'm going to start receiving no less than 10 calls every week from people in this church saying, I have just prayed with somebody, and to God be the glory, they accepted Jesus as their Savior. You are the greatest evangelist. Whoever uh, allows God to use them can be the greatest evangelist that we've ever seen and never step foot behind a pulpit because God is going to take it to the streets. So as we go on and read this story of Naaman, verse 9, then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house, and Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan. How many times? Seven times. And your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. That's pretty nice to get a guarantee. I have seen times in services where the preacher or whoever's speaking said, if you come up, God's going to heal you. I've seen it, and it's happened. It doesn't happen every time. There's been plenty of times we laid hands, prayed, anointed with oil, and believed for God to heal somebody, and they walked away, and they weren't healed. This was a situation where if Naaman did what he was told, it, it was a guarantee he would be healed of leprosy. Now, if that's you and that's me, we're probably getting on our SpongeBob SquarePants swim trunks and jumping in doing the biggest belly buster, cannonball, whatever you could do in the Jordan River. Amen? I'm like, bring it on. Here I come, river. I will not be the same. But Naaman... Became furious. He just received a guarantee. And he's mad about it. Why? Well, let's find out. And he went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, Oh, here comes the problem. Expectation versus faith. Woo. Indeed, I said to myself, He, meaning Elisha, will surely come out to me. <clears throat> Isn't it funny how we make up all this stuff in our head? He'd already played this out. I mean, I'm surprised he didn't bring CNN and Fox News with him. And he was like, okay, I want y'all to make sure the lighting's right. I'm going to step, step on the porch. He's going to come out. He's going to wave his hand. I mean, this is going to be all over the news in Syria. I could imagine thinking like that because look what he's saying. He said, I'm expecting him to stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God. And, oh, he even, <clears throat> he even said what motion Elisha was supposed to do. He's supposed to wave his hand. Isn't that funny? I mean, he don't even know Elisha. And yet he's coming up saying, okay, he needs to do one, two, three, four things. And finally, he needs to heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, 
better than all the waters of Israel? Can I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. I wonder how many times we've missed a mighty miracle of God because he didn't do it the way we wanted it. Sometimes I, I like to say, let's let it sink in a little. That's one of those times. How many times have we missed out on a miracle of God because he didn't move the way we expected? Expectation and faith are not the same thing. Expectation can be a pizza dream you had, and you're just expecting something crazy. Somebody's going to give me a million dollars tomorrow, and I'm going to go to uh, Disney World with my family, then we're going to buy us a new house, a new car. Expectation is just expectation, but faith is always based on something bigger than you. Expectation might be on a, I, I, I think something might happen, so I'm just expecting. But faith says, I know it's going to happen because God promised it, and nothing that he put in this word will pass away. Mm. Don't ever let your expectation overcome faith. See, all that Naaman had to work with should have been what was spoken to him from Elisha, and that's it. Because only what came from the mouth of the little the slave girl and Elisha the prophet were things that he could react to and believe in. Yet he let expectation overcome faith. And his servants, in verse 13, came near and spoke to him and said, My father... If the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? Think about that. Sometimes what God asks us to do is so simple that we think there's no way that's God. Because if it were God, he'd tell me I needed to dress up real nice and head to uh, some revival going out in Houston, Tex going on in Houston, Texas, and I, need, I can only get prayed for by a certain preacher. And, and now that would be God if he said it like that. But if he tells me to call up my aunt and uh, say, would you pray over the phone with me? that I'll be healed. There ain't no way. <clears throat> That's too easy. And Naaman was dealing with the exact same problem. They were saying, Naaman, if he told you to do something just crazy, hard, I mean difficult, you'd have been like, okay, let's do it. But because it was something like this, you're refusing. How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? Verse 14, so he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. There it is. He put expectation in a trunk somewhere and pulled out faith because now his reaction was based on an actual word from the prophet. When you want God to move in your life, please do not react to some fly-by-night wannabe prophet who says they got a certain title off the internet for five bucks. Can I get an amen? Make sure you only act in faith either on the word of God from hearing his voice or from someone whose what they spoke lines up with the Bible. So it said that when he went down and dipped seven times, that on that seventh time he came up and his flesh was like that of a small child. Have any of you ever jumped in a pool I just stopped my question there. I was going to get more detail. Any of you ever just got in a pool? Anybody ever jumped in the river? Way down in the river. So you know what it's like? I've heard some people were so desperate to get baptized, they used to baptize people in the winter. In the river. In the winter time. Some of y'all got baptized in cold. You've done it. Since most of you have jumped in some type of water, do you remember the shock to your system when you got in? And you really hope that you can plunge in all the way over your head first so you can start being accustomed to the temperature of the water? Some of you, now some of you is like, whoop. Then you'll get, get your ankle. Like if you go to the beach, you know, you can't just dive in, so it's a little rough at the beach. But if it's cold, it's kind of rough because you go in and, and some people just like, man, I'm going to hurry. And they'll get their surfboard and they just go running into the ocean. i got to get, get my body adjusted. God knew that there needed to be some things adjusted and changed in the temperature of Naaman's life. Why was it that God said, I want you to dip seven times? Well, I prayed about it and I can't say that I have scripture to say that this is exactly why. But I come up with seven reasons. Why that I know that God wanted Naaman to deal. I still don't know for sure why he said seven, except that it represents completion. But there were at least seven things that Naaman needed to leave underneath the water before he came back up. 
We think of baptism in our modern day times. And <clears throat> what I like is that the longer you stay in the water, the less you want to come out. Oh, Brother Aaron, you might want to use that one day. The deeper you go, the less likely it is you want to jump back out and get on the shore. Why? Because now, as you become accustomed to that water, it feels like you're freezing when you get out of the water. Anybody relate to that? Come on, somebody. Amen. As we jump into the water of the movement of God's Spirit, at first it will shock many people's systems. They'll think, whoo, man, that's so much different from the way I've been living or what I've been thinking. But as you stay in that water and the more you dip into the depths of God's spirit and of his word, you're going to get so accustomed to the move of God that you'll say, I don't even want to get out of this water, even though I know i got a great work to do. I don't want to step out and get back on shore because now what shocked me has become part of me. What disturbed me has now made me feel at home. Oh, am I getting with anybody today? That's why some people, they'll come to church and they're like devils. They're heathens. They're crazy. I mean, they're doing stuff they ain't nobody has any business doing and if their mom and daddy found out they would be turning blood red but when they get to church and the Holy Ghost starts moving and they come up to an altar and or get saved at their chair and they say God I know who I am you know who I am and I know you're the only one who can fix me dear Jesus come into my life save my soul I accept what you did on the cross for my sins make me new again that same person who walked in a heathen a foul mouth a porn watcher somebody who did drugs somebody who drank alcohol cheated on folks uh, said all things, those same people that were homosexual, those same people who used to uh, do awful, maybe they shoplifted at the mall, those same people walk out of the church and they are never the same again. Why? It's because even though the Holy Ghost might have shocked them at first, they got so comfortable with the move of him and his purity and his righteousness in their soul, they said, honey, I don't ever want to get out of this move. When's the next time you're having church? I'll be here 15 minutes early for prayer praise God say how in the world can somebody change like that it's because once they go deeper in the water they get so accustomed to it they do not want to come out does anybody relate to that so why did Naaman dip down let's look at seven things quickly number one pride pride almost caused him to miss his miracle and doesn't he know who I am? He, he won't even come out on the front porch sit on the swing and drink a sweet tea with me what's wrong with this prophet Pride could have kept him from ever going into the Jordan. But thank God when he went down, that first time I can see pride staying below. Second thing, he goes down again. This time it was his reputation. His reputation could have caused him to think so highly, just like pride, of himself. Thinking, man, when I come here, nobody looks at me the way they do back in Syria. I'm going to turn around and go back where I'm respected. They don't bow to me. They don't talk about the great battles I've won. They say, oh, stay away, you leper. His reputation could have kept him from dipping in that water but praise God when he went down that second time I can see his reputation being buried and when he comes back up he doesn't care if anybody knows his name he's just got to know more about this God of Elisha number three he had rage has anybody ever had trouble with rage in your life rage can make you say things you did not mean to say rage can cause you to go places and do stuff that you never would have done when you were calm but because of the nature of rage we react spontaneously to a point where we do things that later embarrass us. Rage was something that Naaman had a problem with. He had a short temper. He was used to getting his way, but when he went down that third time, I can see rage being buried underneath that water. When he came back up, he was not going to be the same. Rage would never control this man again because he was about to get in touch with somebody who could heal his body. Number four, expectation. I just talked about this. When he went down that fourth time, I see expectation being overwhelmed with the tide of the river Jordan's faith I can see that he goes down one way expecting something but when he comes up he begins to believe what the man of God has said why was he working in faith because he had dipped four times and there was no healing he had went down four times in the muddy water and his flesh still looked the way that it did before how many of you have ever had people to pray for you to be healed and you started moving that part of your body and it still hurt and you said oh well God's not going to do it tonight anybody with me you go up and say, oh, uh, evangelist is here tonight. I know I'm going to get my miracle. And he lays hands on you and you get chill bumps. You get goose bumps and you're like, whoa, I know God's healed me. And then you walk back and you're like, oh, man, I don't, I don't feel uh, any different except I just got a few chills. 
and, and you know that you're not completely well, and you know the first thing that happens? We start saying, well, I guess it ain't going to happen. Well, I guess I'm not good enough. Well, I guess I didn't pray the right prayer. Maybe that guy, he's, he's probably in sin. That preacher, he's probably in sin. It's probably his fault. Something that he didn't have enough faith. We try to come up with all kinds of reasons. And yet here's God saying that even Naaman wasn't healed on the fourth time. Even Naaman had to get beyond expectation. Well, by this time, my skin should be made whole. But see, expectation was not faith. Faith said, you're not going to be made whole, according to Elisha's word, until the seventh time. So you better get to dipping, Naaman, because you've only hit four times. You still got three to go. Expectation had to be buried. Number five, idolatry had to sink to the bottom of the Jordan. Here was a man who was raised up as a child bowing down to little or, or to great idols, false gods, things that uh, were of a heathen nation, pagan people. Syrians, they bowed down to all types of things. And that was all he knew. Tonight I'm probably going to get on more of this. But we are facing a time of witnessing in America where we're going to have a, a generation of young people who will stare at you when you talk about Jesus. 20 years ago, you'd have talked about the Lord, and they'd been like, yeah, I know my mom and daddy took me to church. Yeah, my parents have prayed with me um, before, before I went to bed. I've learned uh, the prayer over the blessing over the food, and I've learned to pray, and now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. Now they'll stare at you and say, I don't even know who Jesus is. There's an absence of truth in the United States of America due to the agenda of a liberal leadership within Washington, reaching all the way to many capitals in our states. We have governors right now bowing as if they have zero spine. When the states and legislature are coming up with laws to protect me and you, now this isn't in Alabama yet, but it, people like me and you who believe that if, if we have beliefs about homosexual marriage, that uh, as preachers we should not be demanded or expected to perform those marriages if they go against the Bible, and, and they're also trying to pass laws where that men can't walk into the bathroom with precious little innocent girls. And you know what some of the governors around the southeast are doing? As the states vote against it and the legislature says, let's protect our children in the, in the public bathrooms, not just school, governors are vetoing it. Now, praise God, North Carolina stood for righteousness and they shut the garbage down. And even through the legal procedures, they made sure they were going to protect the children of North Carolina. And you know what started happening in Georgia? That's, I believe it was, it was Georgia. Um, the people over the Super Bowl, over Disney World, and there was one other, and I don't have the facts, so I don't want to misquote, started calling up the governor and saying, if you don't veto this, we'll pull back the Super Bowl. If you don't do this, we're going to pull all the money we're pouring into your state and, and pull it out. And he bowed down to special interest groups. Jesus said, you either serve God or you're going to serve money. Which one are you going to choose? That can be in our own lives. We, we have sometimes struggles whether we're going to truly serve God or whether money means more to us than, than pleasing the Lord. We have our own personal battles, but as far as a, at a state level, we are facing a battle that the United States has never seen in all of its history. Where that the very protection over the children of the United States is at risk based on what we do. Idolatry had to be buried in the Jordan. Number six, he was going down. He had two times to go. Six, I can see something being left down called submission, total submission to my king. See, before he would have done anything, even died for his king, but now he realized there was another king that was about to come sit on a throne of his heart. There was a king called the king of Israel, the God of Israel, the God, the creator, the great I am, that I am that Moses talked about to the children of Israel. That God was about to replace the king on the heart of Naaman. So the the total submission to the king had to be buried. And finally, he went down the very last time. And not based on expectation, but based on faith. When he came up this time, he believed. And the Bible says that his skin was just like a child's. God did what he said. And he responded to the faith, not the expectancy, of Naaman. I want to read a few more verses, then we'll... See where the Lord leads. Verse 15, And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, 
You hear that? Isn't that something? He said, Samson, you hear that? He said, now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. Tonight, I'm going to get into more detail about the Jewish girl who gave Naaman a tip of how he could be healed. We're going to talk about this generation and how they're about to shake America in Jesus' name. But I want you to see that because of the faith of one young girl, it set off a chain of events that led to a personal revival in the life of the commander of Syria's army. Think about that. Isn't that amazing? He said, there is no other God in all the earth except in Israel. Elisha refused his gift because there was only one gift that God wanted from Naaman. It was the gift of carrying what had been done in his life back to Syria and telling everybody he knew. Naaman spoke up and he said, Elisha, there's one more thing that's really bothering me. And I need to go ahead and confess it because I'm going to need some help. He said, please don't let it be held against me when I'm, I'm back in, in Syria and when I'm the right-hand man of my king and I go and help him into the temple of a false god and when I bow down because I'm, I'm helping my king get up and down don't let that be held against me he loved God so much that he wanted to make sure that God would see beyond action and see heart Elisha spoke to him and he said verse 19 go in peace so he departed from him a short distance Naaman wasn't just healed on the outside, but because of a precious Jewish captive girl, Naaman was set totally free from sin, and he was delivered. He had a new heart. I know this was before the blood of Jesus could be applied, but he had faith just like many other Gentiles during this time. And I believe God honored his faith, and he was told to go in peace. Stand with me, please. Got a question for you. Are you willing to get into the river? It will shock your system. It will shock your flesh. And it will be extremely uncomfortable at first. And you're going to wonder how in the world do people live like this every day of their lives? Talking about Jesus, praying, doing good, living by the word, reading the word, praying. I mean, how do they do it? It's going to be a shock to your system at first, but God's going to quickly cause you to adjust to his presence. And it will become like home to you and you'll wonder how you ever lived outside of that anointing. How did I ever walk outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ? Earlier when the Lord was moving and I asked people to turn to their neighbor and ask, did they know Jesus? I'd like to know, was anyone saved during that time? Because if the Lord forgave you of your sins, you certainly want to tell somebody about it. If you'll raise your hand, did anybody pray that prayer? Amen. Hallelujah. And if you did and you want to come see me after service, please get my attention. Heavenly Father, we are yours. We do not belong to any person, any business, corporation. We don't belong to anybody but you. I'm asking God that what we would do would be pleasing to you and that, Lord, you'd help us to only speak what you would say, only do what you tell us to do. God, if there's anything else you want to accomplish in the altars, mm. I just heard healing. I just heard healing. If you need healing in your body, we are going to obey the word, not based on expectation, based on faith. <clears throat> Call the elders of the church. Let them anoint you with oil. Prayer of faith will save the sick. If he's committed any sins, they'll be forgiven him. The Lord will raise him up. <clears throat> if you need a healing in your body, we are going to believe with you, not in expectation, but in faith. By his stripes, you were, past tense, healed. Amen. Anybody else want to respond? Say, I just need the Lord to touch me. There's, there's a part of my body that needs to be touched by him. Maybe it's a healing in the mind. You say, I, I've got some stuff I can't let go of. I need God to help me. Healing, God said. Healing. It's going to be a different kind of request in altar service, but if God's ever healed you at all in your body, you know it was him. I want you to come stand behind these. If you know God was the only one responsible, 
It wasn't a doctor or medicine. I'm talking it was a healing by God, just like we're asking for right now in this service. You know he's touched you. I want you to come up and help me pray. How many believe that God will heal these two before they leave? How many believe? Because if you agree with us, we're in unity. God moves in unity. Amen.